All right, very good. So welcome to this uh, masterclass for uh, Cambridge International exams. Uh, this is uh, AS level, and we're looking at AS level biology. Uh, we're looking tonight uh, at a paper from 2014, the winter series. Uh, this is a structured paper, paper two, um, and we'll cover the uh, questions in here that have been really flagged up by the examiner as needing particular attention uh, from students. Uh, if there's questions where it's just a question of uh, looking up the answer in a revision guide or a textbook, then we'll skip over those. Those are, sorts of, those are the sorts of things that you can do for yourself. But we'll try and pick up on some of the things that the examiner said uh, after the students had completed this exam uh, in 2014. Very good. Yeah, there we go. All right, first one uh, up is this electron micrograph. Uh, and you know that these uh, micrographs have particularly high uh, magnification. So we've got particular uh, uh, detail of all the organelles that we can see here. And let me get my pen working. So we've got very high magnification here, much more than we'd achieve with a uh, light microscope. And the that the examiner pointed out that a lot of students kind of rushed in here because it was the first question in the paper and actually missed <laughs> that this was uh, electron micrograph of the small intestine because uh, you can see in here there's some structures that are quite familiar uh, in the uh, lining of the lungs so for example uh, sorry in the lining of the trachea and the bronchi so you've got a goblet cell there and there's some things here that look like um, the uh, CI that you have uh, on the inside of the uh, trachea and bronchi. But the examiner is saying, well, be very, very careful about how you start your exams because this is nothing at the moment in this question to do with cells inside the lungs. This is all to do with cells inside your small intestine. So just be careful you don't rush in. And um, your first job was to identify uh, these uh, cells here. So those are microvilli, just on the surface there uh, of this cell um, on the lining of the small intestine. And you've got to do, um, this is sort of in an examiner speak, this is a command word, identify, we did that, those are microvilli. And then this is another command word, state. So we're looking for two marks there, and we've got two command words. So we've got to identify, we've done that already, that's the microvilli. And then the role, to state their role, you've got to say that those, um, um, the, 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 the function of that structure is to increase surface area. You're in the uh, lining here of the small intestine. It's all about uh, absorption. Uh, during the process of digestion and so we need as high a surface area as possible uh, to promote um, absorption of all the um, material that's coming through the small intestine so you had your command your command words there and watching out for the command words and noting how many um, marks are required uh, is all part of your exam technique Okay, now this is electron micrograph. Uh, we can see quite high resolution here. Um, and it says, well, if you look in there, you can see a large number of mitochondria. And you've got to suggest why, again, that's another command word, suggest um, why the cell B, let's have a look at that. You can see it here. These are all the mitochondria you can see in the cell. Why, there's, why that cell is so packed with mitochondria? Well, um, you've got to suggest that. So mitochondria uh, are the uh, site in the cell for the production of ATP. And ATP is going to be used for active transport. And that means that uh, there is uh, an active process to transport uh, small molecules from the small intestine into the cell so that they are absorbed. And the um, 
energy to power that active transport has got to come from somewhere. It's ATP. Where does the ATP come from? It's going to come from the mitochondria. Okay, so we're uh, still looking at this electron micrograph, and you've got to calculate the actual length of the nucleus. Now, where's that? Here, all right? So um, the length there is going to be from here to here. And what we're seeing in this picture is the image, isn't it? The image size. And you're given here a magnification electron micrograph. It's a high magnification. And you need to have in your head uh, the expression that the magnification is equal to the image size over the actual size. Okay, well, you've got a little um, uh, equation there. You've got the image, the image side, we just measured it. It's from there to there. You need a ruler to do that. I can't draw a straight line with this pen. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we've got a magnification. Now, when I measured the length of that, I got uh, about 30 millimeters. You, you might have measured it slightly different, but it's going to be a, a, about that for this nucleus here. So you've got image size. Uh, that's 30 millimeters. You've got magnification. We need to work out the actual size. So you just rearrange all of that. And then the actual size is going to be the image size, isn't it? Divided by the magnification. Okay, and the image size, what we have that? We have 30 millimeters, and we're dividing it by six thousand and when uh, I do that calculation then I get 5 times 10 uh, to the minus 3 millimeters All right. now that's uh, not the normally the way you'd express the size uh, of an organelle and you need to remember your metric uh, system don't you so for uh, a millimeter, that is 10 to the minus 3 meters. Next one down is a pen. Next one down is a micrometer, like that. And that's times 10 to the minus 6. And the next one down from that, you can see we're going down in uh, uh, steps of 1,000, is the nanometer, and that's 10 to the minus 9. So it's much more natural to express uh, instead of saying 10 to the minus 3 millimetres, 10 to the minus 3 millimetres is the same as saying 5 micrometres. So uh, you've got to give that value uh, in this uh, answer here. So we've got 5, um, it's telling us, isn't it, micrometres here, to the nearest 0 0.1 of a micrometre. Well, we actually calculated exactly on 5, so to have that to the nearest uh, point 0.1, uh, we have 5.0. Because if you're counting, you're going 4.9, 5.0, 5.1, 5.2. Those are all units of 0.1 micrometer, and the nearest one that we had was 5.0. So you've got to have uh, the 5.0 uh, in there uh, for your answer in mi micrometers. Now, at this point, the question is switching, isn't it? And it's saying, well, okay, we saw uh, the cells in the small intestine there, um, but we're now switching to the lining of the trachea and the bronchi in the gas exchange system, and there's, there's goblet cells there. So that's why the examiner is saying, you've got to be quite careful here, because you started off talking about the small intestine, you're talking about uh, the um, uh, gas exchange now, um, and some students, when they answered this question, weren't able to switch between thinking about the small intestine uh, and the um, uh, structures in the lungs. So the goblet cells in the lungs, now you've got three points here. All right. So uh, goblet cells, you're going to choose, well, they, the main function of those is to secrete 
mucus. So that's one of your points. Well, why are they secreting mucus? Uh, that's there to trap um, dust and other uh, pathogens as well. Might be uh, bacteria. And uh, so the goblet cells are secreting mucus. The mucus is there to trap dust or pathogen. And this is a kind of uh, if you, it's, it's kind of logical narrative here. And the reason for trapping dust or pathogens is to stop infections in the lung. So I think that's uh, a nice three points there because you're making a kind of coherent, logical, flowing narrative here uh, about the role of the goblet cells because it's not sufficient just to say it secretes mucus. Well, that is one of the things that the goblet cell does, but you've got to go for three points here. So if you can have this kind of logical sequence of secreting muc mucus, the mucus is there to trap dust. Why is that important? Well, it stops uh, pathogens uh, infecting the lung later on. So uh, we had to do this switch, didn't we, between um, the cells that are in the part of the lungs, the alveoli, and the cells that we saw in the electron micrograph. So at this point, we're drawing those two um, uh, parts of the body uh, together in the question. The small intestine at the start, and then um, the, uh, the lungs at the, the, the end of this question. And you've got to say, well, how do the alveoli in the lungs differ from the cells you saw in the electron micrograph? And because uh, in the electron micrograph, we were looking at the small intestine and we had active transport there. In the lungs, we have passive transport. And so these cells in the lungs will need less ATP. And so they're going to have less mitochondria. Um, that's one of the differences. And then the second difference the examiner is looking for is that the cell uh, walls are much thinner in the alveoli so that you can get uh, gas transport uh, uh, through, uh, through the cell walls. Okay, question one. Now, question two, um, and the again, the examiner uh, found that students found this quite difficult, strange enough, because uh, there's only, only one mark here. And the trap that many students fell into at this question was to talk about, excuse me, infectious diseases only. And so the examiner was saying too many students, when they read the word disease, students thought in their head infectious disease. And so the students then put a long narrative here about what infectious diseases were. But you've got to broaden your definition of disease because there are uh, diseases, of course, um, which uh, aren't caused by infections. So you've got to have, at that point, uh, a very, very general um, definition of disease. And the examiner is looking for something like, um, and this is what the, the uh, it had in the mark scene, an abnormal condition having an adverse effect adverse effect on the organism all right so that includes doesn't it uh, infectious diseases but it's sufficiently wide to include other diseases that aren't caused by uh, infections and so the point that the examiner made in the uh, examiner's report was that too many students saw the word disease and immediately jumped in with just a subsection of disease talking about um, infectious diseases. So just, uh, again, this is uh, all about reading, isn't it, the uh, questions very carefully and answering what the question asked rather than what you think the question asked. And you know, we all have in our heads um, what we'd like to answer. <laughs> so we tend to read the question in the way we'd like to answer it. But uh, that's a trap. Uh, you've got to read the question carefully, of course, and answer what the question is asking, not what you would like the question to ask. 
Okay, this is, uh, I think this is uh, a fairly nice uh, question here. Um, and actually there's, you know, quite a lot of uh, information in the question and relative to the amount that uh, you've got to provide uh, as a student. And the question uh, is showing four different ways that a person be can become uh, immune. And you've got to write these four types of immunity. And the examiner's looking there for you to use combinations of uh, natural or artificial immunity and active or passive. Now, it's pretty easy to understand the difference between natural and artificial. Natural is obviously something that the body does itself. Artificial is something that we administer to the body. The active and the passive, the passive just means that in some way uh, we're just providing pre-made antibodies. They're just being provided to the body. An active uh, immune response, of course, is when the body has been stimulated to make uh, new antibodies. And so we've got to put uh, these combinations into the boxes down here. Now, if you just take uh, some antibody and inject it in, well, that's obviously artificial. And because um, we're just adding the antibody rather than uh, stimulating the body to produce its own antibodies, that is a kind of passive. It's an artificial uh, passive immunity. The next one down here, um, when uh, an antibody uh, enters the baby by drinking uh, breast milk, then the, you know, the, the, the baby isn't being stimulated to make its own antibodies. It's getting its antibodies from its mother. So again, that is passive immunity. Antibodies are being provided, but this, of course, is completely natural. So those are our two types of uh, passive immunity. These ones over here are going to be where the body is stimulated to produce its own antibodies. So that's going to be uh, an active type of immunity. And we can stimulate it either through vaccine, so that's going to be uh, artificial, or the body uh, will just have to mount its own immune response because some non-self antigen has been presented uh, in the body. So, and that's completely natural. So you just had to uh, put into those four boxes the po four possible combinations of either active or passive immunity and whether that immunity uh, was um, provided um, or stimulated in a natural way or artificial way. Now this, um, this next question here, I, I find um, I find this pretty interesting, really, because what you've got to do here is it's almost as if you've got to imagine that this is uh, some kind of presentation that you're doing, and you've got to talk the audience through, the listeners through, what this graph is showing. And uh, as you do that, um, you've got to uh, help your listeners uh, understand the graph uh, using a descriptive uh, uh, kind of narrative, but you've got to back up your description with hard facts. So what I'm uh, talking about there is you can have a qualitative description, so you're just uh, uh, describing what this graph shows, but you've got to back up your qualitative description with quantitative data. So, for example, uh, you might say as a qualitative description that the number of cases of smallpox uh, decreased uh, from 1950 to a point where smallpox was eradicated in 1980. And that's, um, you know, that, that's a, a qualitative description. It's a general description of what's happening in that graph. But you would then um, make it quantitative to say that um, in uh, 1950, there were almost half a million uh, cases of smallpox without, uh, throughout the world. Uh, and by um, 1980, uh, the vaccination program had been so uh, successful that there were, um, there, were, there were no new cases of smallpox and smallpox had been eradicated. So you start talking about 
real data that you can see to back up the qualitative description uh, uh, that you're giving. And the uh, ex examiner uh, gave uh, uh, a, a number of examples of how you could give that kind of qualitative description and back it up by quantitative data. Uh, for example, you could say during the years um, between 1950 and 1980, there were three major outbreaks or three major peaks of smallpox, ca smallpox cases. Uh, one in 1952, uh, one in 1950, what is that, eight, uh, and one in 1974. So uh, there's three peaks, that's your qualitative description, and then you're making that quantitative by saying the actual date, and you can make it even more quantitative by saying that this, these um, uh, cases of smallpox peaked at a certain level. So you're putting data onto the qualitative description that you're giving. Um, and so that, I think that was the, the main thing the examiner was, was looking for there, that you could have this qualitative narrative and this quantitative data to back it up. And some students incorrectly um, talked about that not the number of cases of smallpox, but the number of deaths due to smallpox. And of course, this graph doesn't tell us anything about the number of smallpox-related deaths. And so, again, this is an example of students um, looking at the question they want to see <laughs> rather than reading the question or the data that is actually given to them. And we might want to write about the number of deaths caused by smallpox because that's something that's in our head from our studies, perhaps. But we've got to look at the actual question and make sure we're using the language of the question that's given to us, not the kind of question that we want to be given to us. So that was uh, uh, the, um, the sort of the main points the examiner picked up there. And this um, this graph here is it, it really looks actually at the uh, World Health Organization's program to eradicate smallpox. So the World Health Organization began a program to eradicate smallpox about here, 1955. You can see that followed a large outbreak earlier in the 1950s. And that was sufficiently successful that by the end of 1980, uh, the World Health Organization declared the world to be free of smallpox. It was a successful program you can see lasting here about 25 years to eradicate smallpox from the entire world population. And so that graph is really a, a picture of that World Health Organization program, uh, which is an incredible success uh, to remove, uh, eradicate uh, infection of smallpox. And so you've got to talk a little bit about uh, that program here. Uh, the World Health Organization is declaring the world to be free of smallpox in 1980. We can see that from the graph. That's an extremely successful result, but it's a success because smallpox, compared to other infections, has a number of features that make it, quote unquote, relatively easy to eradicate. Now, you can see that it's actually not easy. <laughs> it took 25, you know, 25 years to do the eradication, but compared to eradicating other diseases, there's a number of features of smallpox that make it particularly good target for eradication. Now, um, so you've, you've got, what have you got? You've got four marks here, and you've got to come up with some of these uh, factors or some of these features that mean that small smallpox could be eradicated more easily than some other infectious diseases. Now, uh, one of those is that the smallpox virus is stable virus. And by that we mean the antigens that are expressed on the surface of the virus don't change. The virus doesn't mutate, it doesn't change the surface antigens that are presented to the body uh, during the infection. Now, uh, other uh, viruses do mutate and their antigens change. So it's almost like an arms race. You're continually trying to um, 
keep up with the way that a virus is changing, but the smallpox virus is a stable virus. It has a stable set of surface antigens. And so if uh, a body mounts an immune response, then you know, whenever there's an infection by smallpox, then the body uh, has antibodies prepared for the particular antigens that are presented uh, from uh, that particular virus. So having uh, a stable virus with a consistent set of surface antigens is important. Um, second one is that the um, vaccine, the, the vaccine was easily prepared because the vaccine was prepared from uh, another virus which had the same set of stable surface antigens but wasn't on its own um, um, a disease causing in the way that the uh, smallpox virus was. So it was easy to, or, you know, relatively easy to prepare a vaccine that had the same set of surface antigens as a smallpox virus. A third one here is that the vaccine, when it was prepared, was easily stored. Now, um, one of the things you can do with biolog some biological mo molecules anyway is a process called freeze drying. Now, what this does is normally a biological molecule is surrounded by water and it forms hydrogen bonds with the water and it has a particular shape um, uh, uh, when it's dissolved in water. And what you do in freeze drying is you remove the water and to stop the biological molecule being denatured, you replace the water with a solid that forms hydrogen bonds. And so the biological molecule environment is like the water environment, except that it's completely dry. And so uh, because this vaccine could be freeze dried, then you could have uh, vaccines which had a very, very long uh, um, uh, shelf life, actually. They, they, you didn't need to keep them refrigerated for a long period of time. You could transport them easily uh, without refrigeration, or, or you could store them in hot climates. And for all these reasons, it was uh, the World Health Organization was able to move vaccine around the world without a lot of problems of infrastructure where perhaps there wasn't uh, op opportunities to keep a biological molecule cool and stable so it being denatured. Uh, this vaccine was easily stored through a process uh, of freeze drying. So the uh, other um, uh, reasons or other factors that the examiner uh, uh, pulled out for this was uh, that actually when uh, someone catches smallpox, the symptoms of smallpox are so distinct and so clear that uh, people who catch smallpox um, are easily identified. It's really easy to spot someone, uh, really easy to do the diagnosis of someone who has been infected with smallpox. And so if um, you have patients that are easily identified, then they can be easily isolated, and that can stop the spread of the smallpox infection from person to person. So again, this is another kind of feature, I suppose, of smallpox that is, helps the World Health Organization and their program uh, for successful eradication. Uh, another one, you only had to get four here, I'm on to number five, you could have four out of five. Another one that the, that the examiner pulled up as well was that um, this smallpox uh, virus does not have an animal vector. Now, in some infectious diseases, you might have a virus uh, which is carried by an animal that uh, isn't infectious to the animal, but it does mean that uh, that virus can then be transmitted from the animal to a human. And because there's no animal vectors, then once you've identified your patients with smallpox and isolated them, then you know there aren't other sources of smallpox infection uh, in that particular environment. So because there's no animal vectors, 
then it means this process of isolating patients and stopping the spread of the infectious disease uh, is much easier than if you had a virus that did have some animal reservoir or some animal vector that was a, a reservoir uh, of the infect infectious virus. Okay, so I think uh, I mean either you know four out of those or other variants of those are all part of the narrative for why uh, the World Health Organization found it relatively easy, took 25 years, uh, to uh, stop uh, the spread of smallpox um, and uh, eliminate uh, smallpox uh, by uh, 1980. Okay, next one. So, um, coming on to now to your study of uh, biological molecules. Um, usually um, you're talking about polymers uh, in the body um, and uh, proteins as you know um, are made from only 20 different uh, amino acids they're sometimes called residues aren't they so 20 different residues or 20 different amino acids and these are polymerized or they're joined together in many different combinations to make uh, proteins that's a long chain of amino acids or you know, polypeptides, that's another way of saying um, many amino acids joined together. Normally the vocabulary here is that a polypeptide chain is shorter than a protein chain, but um, that's the, um, the, 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 the kind of vocabulary that's understood by the difference between polypeptides and proteins. And you've got to name the type of chemical reaction when two amino acids form a dipeptide, so you've got in this case just two amino acids, they're joining together to form di, it means two, doesn't it? A dipeptide. And I think it's easier to answer that after this part. Sometimes it feels like these questions are the wrong way around. So if we just answer this part here and then pop back to answer that one in a moment, because down here they've given you two amino acids, right? So these are the amino acids. You've, amino acid has an amine group at one end, just there for that one, glycine. The amino group uh, is here, isn't it? It's that part there. That's the amine part of amino acid. And this part of the amino acid is the carboxylic acid part. Right? So they're common parts of an amino acid. And then the amino acid has this carbon in the middle and it has a side chain. Now glycine, of course, is the simplest amino acid. You could hardly call that a side chain, it's just got a, a hydrogen atom uh, there. Other amino acids have more complex side chains. You can see there's a, uh, a, a, a rather more complex side chain over here. So the structure of amino acid is always the amine group, a carbon with a side chain, either simple or complex, and a carboxylic acid group uh, at the end. So those are your two amino acids. Just get the clean that up a bit. And when those two amino acids are, are bonded together, joined together, then uh, a water molecule is removed. Okay? I've got H2O, so I'm removing a water molecule. Or I'm eliminating a water molecule. And that's really why this question order seems uh, the wrong way around because uh, the name of this type of uh, reaction is um, closely related to the, um, that water molecule we just saw. So that's condensation reaction. Yeah, that's the one that went in there. And so what's happening here is this water molecule is being eliminated. It's a condensation reaction. And you're getting a new bond formed between the carboxylic acid there and the amine group there. And the best way to answer this question really is just to draw out these formulae. Technically, they're called displayed formula because you're displaying or you're showing the position of every single atom, the displayed formula. And so you've now got, we've removed that OH there and that H there. And so there's now a bond directly to that nitrogen atom there. We remove the hydrogen. That hydrogen is still here. And I've got my 
water molecule there that was eliminated. And then you've got the rest of that amino acid, its side chain here. You have to excuse my writing, I'm not very good with this computer pen. I think you can see what I'm doing. Uh, and then there's still a carboxylic acid group at the end there, and you've still got an amine group at the end there. And of course, that's now ready to polymerize with another carboxylic acid from another amino acid there. And this is now ready to polymerize with an, another amino group from another amino acid there. And so you end up growing this chain of amino acids and a small chain will be called a polypeptide, a long chain, you call that a protein. And when we did that process, that condensation reaction, we removed water. So that was condensation. And it's not um, in this question, but it comes up uh, quite frequently in exams. The opposite of that process, where you're breaking the bond there, and you're going back to an amino acid with a carboxylic acid group, and another amino acid with an amine group. The opposite of that is hydrolysis, okay? Now, if your Greek is any good, uh, hydro is all to do with water, and lysis is all to do with breaking something, splitting something up. So hydrolysis, hydrolysis, is breaking up something using water which is the opposite of this uh, reaction we had here, this condensation reaction, which eliminated water. And so that bond that's formed here, now, again, it wasn't asked in the question, but that is a peptide bond. All right, so we formed a peptide bond by uh, a condensation reaction of two amino acids to make a dipeptide. Okay, still talking about, uh, well, actually talking about protein synthesis still here because we're talking about um, how uh, a, a, the primary structure of a peptide is uh, determined because uh, a sequence of a triplet code in the DNA has been transcribed. Uh, and these are RNA codons here. And then these RNA codons are then finally translated to um, um, a series of amino acids which are joined by peptide bonds. So that's the primary structure uh, of a protein or the primary structure of a polypeptide. And so in this uh, question here, you're being asked to uh, fill in some of these blanks. So you've got to know a little bit about your... Um, Uh, chemical structure of DNA and RNA. Now, it, you know, there's no blanks here in the translation part, so you're looking at transcription between the DNA and the RNA. So you need to know that in uh, DNA, you've got uh, these bases. You've got adenine, you've got thiamine, you've got cytosine, and you've got Guanine. So those are the bases that are available for building DNA. And for RNA, you've got adenine again, you've got uh, cytosine, you've got guanine, but instead of having the thymine, you're uh, changing that to uracil. So those are the four bases uh, in RNA. And I'm running out of uh, space here. Have I got some space up here? I'll, I'll just rub that out. I think you've got that already. Okay, good. All right. So, um, so in the process of transcription, which is what's happening in this um, uh, question here, you need to know that you've got DNA as a double helix. And the bases that we can have on DNA, we just wrote them before, is uh, adenine, and then you can have cytosine, can't you? You can have thymine, and you can have guanine. Okay? And 
Uh, in DNA, you've got a double helix because these bases do something called complementary uh, base pairing, and each base has a complementary base that it can hydrogen bond to. So uh, in DNA, the that's the complementary base pairing between adenine and thymine. And then you've got complementary base pairing to guanine there. So I'm, my diagram's a bit small. You've got complementary base pairing to adenine there, and you've got complementary base pairing base pairing to cytosine there. Okay. Now, in the process of transcription, this uh, double helix of DNA is going to uh, open up the double helix, and one of these strands becomes the, the coding strand. You have to excuse my writing. <laughs> That's the coding strand. And the coding strand, uh, if you remember the uh, numbering on the um, pentose sugars that form the back bank, backbone of DNA, that coding strand is running from carbon number five always back to carbon number three. It's going from five to three. And so that um, coding strand uh, separates out. So I'm just going to remove its complementary base pairs. And instead, um, you get an enzyme called RNA polymerase, which is now going to put, uh, um, I'll build up, um, some RNA. But this time, because the RNA has one base different, you're going to end up with a complementary base pairing like this, where that's the uracil, that's the guanine, that's the adenine, and that's the cytosine. Okay, so it's slightly different to the base pairing that we just had with uh, DNA because we swapped a thymine for a uracil there. And once that uh, RNA is built up, it's called messenger RNA, and it's going to be moving off to uh, ribosomes, which are the organelle uh, associated with uh, protein synthesis. And then uh, you get a process of translation of turning these codons into the primary uh, structure of uh, a polypeptide or protein that's built up. And so because you've got to know uh, the four bases uh, in DNA and the four bases in RNA and how the bases have complementary base pairing, you've got to use that information to fill in uh, these blanks here. And what you get is the complementary base pairing of guanine, adenine, and uracil, guanine, uracil, uracil, and then you have to work backwards here where you get adenine, adenine, and guanine. Now, um, so I, I think, uh, let's see, what did you have to do? So I think you actually had to work quite hard for your one mark there, because you, you had to remember, didn't you, um, the bases in DNA and the difference with the bases or the base in RNA, and you had to remember as well the base pairing. So that was quite hard work for one mark. Strangely enough, this next question seems like you don't have to work very hard at all because um, this, the RNA that's being built up here is going to be moving off the DNA template and going to ribosomes where the, uh, the codons of the RNA can be read and uh, protein synthesis can happen. And all you've got to say is what is the name of this type of RNA? Well, later on in the ribosome, you're going to be using transfer RNA, but this is just the messenger RNA. And strangely enough, again, um, some students, according to the examiner, because they were rushing, wrote mRNA. And actually, even though you'd think that was correct, the examiner wasn't giving them a mark for that, because in the question, it said state, that's our command word again, state the full name, all right? So it's not good enough in this case to write mRNA. 
the examiner is being a bit tough at this point and saying, well, there was a command there, state, you had to give the full name, and so only if you wrote messenger RNA did the student get the mark. And again, this is an example of answering the question that we're given rather than answering the question that we want. Um, just a point there, and uh, you know, you can see that's an easy mark to lose. If I was rushing, I'd probably written M R M R N A as well there as, as well. But you've got the command word, and you've got the uh, information, the question. You've got to write the full name of the messenger RNA. Okay, now. Uh, okay, this is a little bit contrived because. Um, this uh, DNA sequence here was talking about a coding for a particular uh, protein, which is involved in um, uh, blood pressure management. And so the, the question pivots at this point to talking about blood pressure. Well, it seems a bit of an awkward uh, way around, but um, we've, we've now moved on from um, the DNA and its triplet code. Uh, we're now talking about blood pressure in the heart. And just, uh, you have to excuse me for a moment, but I'm just going to draw a very, very s massively simplified picture of the heart. Now, the heart has four chambers. You have to excuse me, this is incredibly <laughs> simplified. The ones at the top are the atria, the ones at the bottom are the ventricles. And the ones at the top have thin walls, they have thicker walls at the bottom here particularly the one here has a particularly thick wall. And this is uh, the right-hand side. And this is the left-hand side. Okay, so that's my uh, view of the heart. And uh, I've got blue here. That can be blue, yes. Okay, so uh, coming in here, is deoxygenated blood. So that's come from the head or the body, and that's coming in under low pressure into the atria on the right-hand side. Now, later on, that's going to be pumped out to the lungs to become oxygenated, and that's going to be at relatively high pressure. And after going through the lungs, then the oxygenated blood is going to come back in here, isn't it? And then next time the heart beats, it's going to get pushed out there again under high pressure. And that goes to the rest of the body uh, on the, uh, in the aorta. And going out here, uh, the blood is going out through the pulmonary artery. Okay. And... Uh, the valves that are controlling that blood flow out of the ventricles, those are called the semilunar valves. Now, you can look up uh, much, much, much better drawings of the heart in your textbooks. Uh, you should be learning how to draw those yourself uh, anyway. Uh, this is an extremely simplified diagram of what's going on in the heart, but it's enough just to understand this question here. And we're going to use uh, uh, the information in this table to explain why the blood pressure in the pulmonary artery, that's this blood which is just about to head off to the lungs, is the same pressure as the blood that was in the right ventricle. You can see here, this is where the um, ventricle is contracting. And this is when uh, it's uh, relaxing. Now, when these ventricles contract, uh, they're squeezing the blood, and these semilunar valves open. So at this point, the semilunar valves are open. And you can see that the pressure in that ventricle there is identical to the pressure in this artery here. Well, that's easy to understand, isn't it? Because uh, the valve is open, and the pulmonary artery is right next to the ventricle where the valve opened up. So if the blood is flowing from the ventricle into the pulmonary artery, then 
they're going to be at the same pressure, which is exactly what you see here. Now, when you get to this phase, the semilunar valve is closed. Yes? And that means that um, as the, the, the blood here uh, is going to continue to be at relatively high pressure, but the blood in here is going to be at low pressure, which is what you see there. And so um, the examiner was looking for three points there and was giving the points for, first of all, let's get back to my red pen. First point was that during this contraction, during the systole, that the semi lunar valve was open. That was the first point. First mark. Uh, second point was that during this other phase, the semi lunar valve was closed. And the third mark was that because um, this pulmonary artery is the artery that leads from the right-hand uh, right side ventricle, and when the semilunar valve is open, because those are adjacent, then the pressure in those two um, um, uh, parts is going to be exactly the same. So the third mark was that the uh, pulmonary artery excuse my writing, is adjacent or leads from the right-hand side ventricle. So those are the three marks uh, the examiner was looking for there. Okay, and then this question is, is kind of odd because it, it's starting with um, the sort of microscopic world of protein synthesis. Uh, from uh, a DNA uh, sequence through to the function of the heart, through to um, now uh, illness here. So we're traversing from the microscopic right through to uh, the macroscopic, uh, the world of uh, human experience. Um, and it's talking about this particular disease, which is um, obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, and in this disease, there's a constriction of blood vessels in the lungs. Now, what's the likely effect of that on the heart? Well, what's happening uh, is that um, the right-hand side ventricle is trying to push blood out to the lungs along the pulmonary artery, but the um, blood vessels in the lungs are constricted. So that ability to push um, blood out is compromised. And so the likely effect on the heart is going to be um, some strain on the right-hand side ventricle. And the examiner would have given a mark for um, heart uh, failure. And he would have given a mark, or she would have given a mark for the well, ch chest pain, uh, but would not have given a mark for heart pain. So the students who wrote chest pain um, were going to get uh, a, a mark. So I'm, I'm on to the next question already. <laughs> Sorry. Because uh, they, they talk down here about the signs and symptoms. Sorry about that. I was ahead of myself. Okay, so we leave that for a moment. We're looking at the likely effect on the, the heart. So, so with the strain on the right-hand side ventricle, uh, heart failure, and because uh, there's this constriction of blood vessels in the lungs, that means it's harder uh, for the heart to pump uh, the blood through that's going to be leading to a rise in the systolic blood pressure. So the other uh, mark that you might have had there was high blood pressure. Believe me, when I'm working with a whiteboard, 
I'm much better at writing on the board than I am writing with the pen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just, I just, for some reason, I find it very difficult to work with this pen. So your, your two marks there, uh, I think a good mark will be strain on the right-hand side ventricle and two uh, high blood pressure. And then again, you've got a couple of marks here. So the signs and symptoms where we, the examiner was uh, allowing chest pain. If you wrote heart pain, I can't even write that, heart pain, then that didn't get the mark. You had to say chest pain. And because um, this is um, uh, the constriction or this obstruction um, in the blood vessels in the lungs is ending up with poorly oxygenated blood. Well, what's that going to mean? That means that there's going to be um, rapid breathing as the patient tries to compensate for the lack of oxygen in their blood by breathing uh, more rapidly. So rapid breathing is uh, one of the signs and symptoms that's trying to compensate for the low level of oxygenation uh, in the blood. Uh, other uh, signs and symptoms that the examiner uh, accepted was, well, oxygenated blood is uh, bright red in color. Uh, so deoxygenated blood gives this kind of bluish color to the skin because the, the blood isn't as fully oxygenated uh, as it could be. So we've got two marks here. If you had chest pain because the uh, uh, right-hand ventricle is um, uh, strained, uh, rapid breathing to compensate for the low level of oxygenation in the blood, and a bluish color uh, for the skin because the blood is not fully oxygenated are all signs and symptoms that are indicative of this underlying condition of having a restriction uh, in the uh, blood vessels uh, in the lungs. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip question four. Uh, the examiner didn't make particularly um, uh, uh, strong comments about that. That's really something that's quite easy to look up. Uh, about uh, mitosis uh, and the process of cell division in this growing root root tip. Uh, it's the mitotic uh, cell cycle, uh, where the two daughter cells uh, are genetically identical to the parent cell. Uh, I think that's a classic example of the kind of thing uh, that you can look up. And we just... Uh, go through to uh, this uh, question here. Uh, there's a uh, insectivorous plant there. You can see the insect uh, has landed uh, on the plant. These uh, little um, uh, actually um, modified leaves are secreting this um, um, uh, material that means that it's very difficult for the insect to escape. Um, and once the insect is stuck, then the plant secretes enzymes uh, and the enzymes digest uh, the uh, insect uh, that's there. Uh, you can see these actually locally in the botanical garden in Cambridge. They've got a whole collection of these different types of uh, insectivorous plants. Um, and, and actually they're, they're, they're live in the botanical garden catching insects right at the moment. You can go and see them uh, with the insects getting uh, digested by these plants. They're, they're there in the botanical gardens. Um, so this, this plant is, it says, both an autotroph and a heterotroph. So it's both, and you've got to, this is your command word here, you've got to explain that, uh, and you've got uh, four marks here. So um, I think, it's, you know, if you're trying to think, well, how do I get four marks on here? Probably you've got to define an autotroph, and say why this plant is an autotroph. And then you've got to define a heterotroph and explain why this plant is a heterotroph. You can see that's a fairly clear strategy for getting the four marks. So for autotroph, okay, again, depends how good your Greek is. Auto 
is uh, something to do with uh, doing something unaided, automatic. It's something to do with self, being able to do something by, by yourself. And troph, again, gr Greek, is self-feeding. Now, you know, why is a plant self-feeding? Well, you know, that, that's the meaning of an, the sort of Greek translation, I suppose, ancient Greek translation, the autotroph, self-feeding. So um, the plant can manufacture complex organic molecules from simple inorganic molecules, the kind of uh, inorganic molecules that can just be gained from the environment. And of course, the classic example of that is photosynthesis, where an inorganic molecule from the, from the environment, carbon dioxide, an inor inorganic molecule from the environment, water, are um, uh, combined in photosynthesis uh, as the starting point for uh, polysaccharide um, synthesis uh, in, inside the plant. And an, another uh, simple organic molecule that can be uh, taken from the environment, uh, ammonia, that's going to be used to build uh, things like uh, proteins from amino acids or nu nucleic acid because you need nitrogen for the nitrogenous bases that form part of nucleic acid. Um, and so this autotroph uh, is uh, as, uh, an organism that can manufacture its own complex organic molecules from the simple inorganic molecules in the environment. And so a plant uh, would typically do that uh, with uh, the process of photosynthesis uh, to start the uh, synthetic pathway to build uh, complex carbohydrates. So that's the autotroph. And uh, this uh, is, is a plant here. So, uh, I mean, if, if you go and look at these plants, then they have these uh, structures that capture the insects, but the rest of the plant just looks like a normal plant. It's got normal leaves, like any other plant, that is doing, uh, uh, that is uh, 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 undergoing or um, are being used uh, for photosynthesis. So, in many respects, it's a normal plant, but it's also an unusual plant because it's a heterotroph. So, um, okay, so um, hetero, if uh, again you're Greek here, that means different. Uh, so, that's feeding. Uh, on different things, you know, not, not things that you've made yourself. It's a heterotroph. So a heterotroph uh, cannot make complex organic molecules from inorganic, um, simple inorganic molecules. And so these uh, plants have evolved when they can't obtain, uh, in this case, uh, ammonia from the environment, that simple organic molecule, then uh, if it's uh, deficient uh, in ammonia, then it can use uh, the digestion of these insects as a source of nitrogen. And so in that respect, it's a heterotroph um, and it's uh, uh, consuming um, uh, the uh, complex molecules from another organism as its source, in this case, uh, of nitrogen that it's going to be using for building proteins and nucleic acids. All right, uh, so we're still talking here, aren't we, about uh, how uh, organisms uh, um, um, get uh, nitrogen uh, for building proteins and uh, nucleic acids. And it's talking about um, a marine ecosystem. And it's talking about uh, essentially the nitrogen cycle. I don't think oh, here it is up here, the nitrogen cycle. So in a marine or, uh, ecosystem, if this is the surface of the sea, uh, 
Well, 79% of the air is nitrogen. There's plenty of nitrogen, but it's locked up in these very, very uh, stable nitrogen molecules. And uh, plants can't use nitrogen molecules. Um, they're, they're, they're too stable for the plants to use in that form. And as uh, you get precipitation, uh, these nitrogen molecules can get washed into uh, the seawater. So you've got dissolved nitrogen in the seawater. And there are bacteria, uh, cyanobacteria, that um, can, it's called fixation, they can fix nitrogen. Their um, metabolism uh, is such that they can take the nitrogen and they can use it directly to build simple uh, uh, molecules like ammonia or urea. And once those molecules have been built, those are simple inorganic molecules that can be used by plants uh, in this uh, marine ecosystem, the ocean, for example. And so the kind of plants that are going to be using these simple molecules are the base of the food chain, the phytoplankton. Okay, so the phytoplankton uh, can uh, build their proteins and their um, nucleic acids because they've got a source of nitrogen as ammonia or urea, and that source of nitrogen was fixed for them by cyanobacteria that can uh, use the nitrogen that's been dissolved in the seawater. And so you've got here now, haven't you, the basis of a food chain because there's going to be higher trophic levels that can feed off these producers here, the phytoplankton. So you've got various consumers here that are going to uh, consume the phytoplankton and use the phytoplankton as their source of nitrogen to build their amino acids and build their nucleic, um, um, nucleic acids as well. Um, and so what the uh, question is uh, saying is that, um, you know, as these uh, excrete, then you can get uh, nitrate ions in the water as well. And the question is saying, well, they discovered these particular bacteria that take uh, ammonia and take nitrate ions. What do they call these bacteria? Um, okay, the particular type of bacteria <laughs> that, that take the nitrate ions and the ammonia ions and return it to nitrogen. Hmm? And so that means because the uh, type of nitrogen that can be used by the phytoplankton is being removed, the phytoplankton can't use the ammonia or the nitrate if it's been turned back into nitrogen, then the phytoplankton will have its growth limited because it will have a limited source of nitrogen. It can't synthesize all the amino acids and proteins and nucleic acids that it needs to and so its growth, the phytoplankton growth, is limited. And if the phytoplankton growth is limited, that's the base of the food chain, then the other consumers that depend on the phytoplankton as the start of the food chain, then they will have their numbers restricted as well. And so the, um, uh, the marks that the examiner was looking for here was that uh, the principle that nitrogen or the availability of nitrogen has become a limiting factor and that's limiting the growth of uh, plants in the case of an aquatic environment or a marine environment that's the phytoplankton so the growth of plants is limited and because there's these consumers that depend on this lower trophic level then uh, there's less food available for these higher trophic levels. And so the examiner is looking for your three points here, that nitrogen is a limiting factor, 
the ammonia and the nitrate have been removed as nitrogen. That's limiting the growth of plants in the marine environment, the ocean environment, that's phytoplankton. And that means the base of the food chain uh, has limited growth. And so that has a, um, a consequential impact at the higher trophic levels of the consumers uh, that are uh, dependent on the phytoplankton. Good. All right, almost over. Uh, last question here. It's talking about uh, uh, this is the uh, soil environment here. There's some water there. And it's asking, well, how does the water go from uh, the soil environment into the intracellular environment here? So this is the movement uh, of water. And the way that this diagram has been drawn for this cell here, you can see this is one cell here. That's because it's a plant. That's a cell wall, isn't it? And this part here is a cell membrane. Okay, excuse my writing. I hope you can hear the words <laughs> that I'm saying rather than read my, my writing because it's, it's quite difficult with this computer pen. Um, and what the examiner is looking for is for you to understand the cell wall is fully permeable, but the cell membrane is only partially permeable. And so uh, water can move through the cell wall through the process of diffusion. But you need to know that the water is going to move through the cell membrane, which is partially permeable, using a special um, form of diffusion, osmosis. And so the uh, language that the examiner is looking for here is um, this uh, understanding that the cell wall is fully permeable, the sem cell membrane is partially permeable, that you have diffusion through the cell wall, and you have this special case of diffusion, osmosis, that's going through the partially permeable uh, cell membrane. And the other uh, vocabulary that you can use is that the water uh, here in the soil environment has a high water potential, and in the intracellular environment here, the water is at a low water potential. <sighs> ah, this is low water potential. So all that vocabulary is the kind of vocabulary that the examiner is looking for for your three marks here. Okay, so, uh, and the rest of that question, uh, you can just uh, look up either in the mark scheme, revision notes, uh, or um, textbooks. So uh, that's uh, a run through uh, this uh, structured paper for AS Biology. Um, if you've still got questions about that, then uh, there are Z coaches on the Slack channel for AS Biology, and you're extremely welcome to put your questions there and uh, we can discuss any questions you've got, either about this paper or other papers that you're working on uh, with the Z coaches on the Slack channel. And all it remains for me to say is to wish you every success in your uh, studies in AS Biology and look forward to the next masterclass uh, in the future.